We're here on a particularly interesting day, which nobody is celebrating, but it's exactly 40 years ago that the internet was really invented, that the four nodes of the ARPANET were switched together on December 2nd, it was 1969, to create what we now call the internet. That unleashed a burst of creativity by pushing knowledge and information down so everybody could be empowered. It also unleashed the potential of the microchip. Moore's law uh, was actually being able to be put in effect. People like Bill Gates, who were able to understand that if the power of the microchip was going to double every 18 months or so and become smaller and faster and cheaper, that you could just use large amounts of computing power as a driver for innovation. I'm going to embarrass him, but Steve Case, one of my old bosses is here, I mentioned it. Inventing AOL, as Steve and, many, uh, and others did, was a way to create communities. It was not just a way to dump data online. And originally, we knew that in the media space. Those of us at Time Magazine and Newsweek and others who decided to work on this realized that we, in this new age, had an innovation that wasn't just a better way to distribute your magazine, but it was a way to create communities around the journalism and thinking you were doing and have user-generated content and uh, discussions and make everybody a part of the process. We got away from that, unfortunately, with the invention of the web, because the World Wide Web allowed us to just dump our magazines and pictures online. People would surf by and see it, and we'd hope to get the eyeballs and sell them to advertisers. And we quit trying to create the notion of community. But you see that happening today in the new innovators and the new entrepreneurs that are basically reinventing the notion of online communities going back to the future, back to what happened in the early uh, late 1980s and early 1990s when these were communities. And so that's what Facebook and YouTube and Twitter are all about. It's really affecting badly, I think, the whole notion of media because we got so used to just handing down the journalism we did that we were not innovative. We did not come up with creative new ways to saying we're not just journalists handing down on engraved tablets uh, what we've reported, but we are people who help form communities and provide a valuable service. Secondly, uh, what we did was we started assuming that just by getting advertisers, uh, we could survive, and we gave away the material for free in order to get advertising. And to me, the important thing is always to have a bond with your community. And I wish we had kept subscription and payment models as well, so that we would have been beholden to our users, not just to the advertisers. And I do think if we're going to unleash a new wave of creativity in our society, we have to be able to reward journalists, writers, anybody, who's creative. In fact, I do think we are reaching an inflection point where the drivers of creativity for the late 20th century may not bring us a sustainable jobs growth in the 21st century. You'll be able to grill Austin Goolsbee about this later. But the microchip was a dynamo that created an entire new industry. The question is, can we be as innovative and create entire new industries in this century? And I think that's going to take three real drivers of our creativity. The first of those is what we talked about so much at this conference, is education. And as President Hennessy and others said, it's not the higher education that's a problem. It's really K through 12 education. And K through 12 education has two great problems in my mind. First of all, we used to be probably number one in creating high schools, number one in high school graduation rates in the world, number one in math and science scores. We are now, depending on how you count it, somewhere between 20th and 30th in the world, whether it's in our math scores, our reading scores, our graduation rates, whatever metric. Secondly, we have an achievement gap. Most people in this room and their children are able to get a really good education, K through 12, if they really try. 
but most people in this country, depending on the zip code in which they're born, are not going to have that equal opportunity. This is bad socially for our society, not to have the type of equal opportunity that came from a Benjamin Franklin as a runaway, being able to uh, make a business, be an entrepreneur. It's also going to destroy us in a uh, information and knowledge-based economies of the future, when so many of our people are left behind. It will take enormous amounts of creativity to revise the K-12 education system. We were talking, it came up on a couple of panels, but if Benjamin Franklin went from that schoolroom that he went to in Boston before he ran away into a schoolroom today, he'd recognize pretty much the same thing. Rows of desks, a teacher, a teacher not really being held accountable, we have a way, if we want to, to reinvent K-12 through education in America, and that could be the greatest guarantor of our future productivity. In New Orleans, we were very unfortunate to have a hurricane, but there was a silver lining to that hurricane. It wiped out the worst school system in this country, almost. One of the worst school systems, Washington being a close contender. And what we did is instead of replicating that school system, we went to the best entrepreneurs, KIPP Academy, the Edison Project, so many others, of people who had created the charter schools that work. And we said to each one of them, we will give you five buildings in New Orleans. You get to run your own schools. There will be no centralized school district. You will be totally empowered to run your school. I work with Teach for America. We had 250 core members when the storm struck. Wendy Kopp and I and others went down. We said to those 250, the school system won't start for another six months. You can go to another town. We'll, re we'll you know, reassign you to Houston or someplace like that. Or you can stay. 250 of the 250 stayed in New Orleans. They were joined by a surge of 500 more Teach for America core members and alumni. Now, one out of two students in New Orleans is being taught by somebody from Teach for America, and one half of the schools are being run by graduates, as Michelle Ree was, of that program. So these are entrepreneurs, but they're getting empowered to do their own schools. What does it take? It takes competition and choice, too. A monopoly school system I don't think is ever going to work, but in New Orleans we've said any parent can pick any one of the schools in their city and send their kid there, and the money follows the school. That's basically a voucher system without using the V word. But it does say that if you create a better school and attract more students, you're going to do better. You know how people are creating better schools to attract more students in an innovative, creative way? It's not just some brilliant use of technology. It's saying, we're going to be open until 6 p.m. There's no reason school should get out at 3, especially in cities where kids haven't been learning. We're going to say the school year is 11 months long. We're going to bring the health clinic from Auctioner into the school and make the family center there. And we're going to have computer labs that are open until 10 at night. Those schools that have done that have attracted the most students. And now even the remnant public schools, the ones, the one quarter of the schools still being run in the old public school system, are now doing that. So competition, choice, can lead to innovation. We need to do that in our education system. So the second thing we talked about was immigration. It is astonishing to me that uh, in conferences like this, people can't come in from different countries because of visa problems. Secondly, they come in, they get a doctorate from Stanford. We should be stapling a green card to every doctorate from Stanford, and maybe some of the doctorates from Harvard even, uh, especially if they're in engineering and technology, instead of forcing them to go home. 